Welcome to the history of ghosts, myths and legends from Merseyside and beyond. Today we're going to be bring, bringing you some short stories from the most haunted cemetery in Merseyside, St James's. The Oratory is a former chapel of St James's Cemetery and was designed by John Foster in 1786. The foundation stone being laid in 1827 by Jonathan Brooks, the rector of Liverpool. He said the purpose of the oratory was to accommodate funeral services before, before burials took place in the cemetery, but it was also used for a kind of cenotaph for housing monuments to the deceased, including works of several noted 19th century sculptures. The oratory and several of the monuments it contains are products of an artistic movement known as the Greek Rival. In adapting the design of the ancient temple to serve the 19th century church, architects were usually obliged to make compromise for particular reasons. Windows, for example, which were absent in the Greek temples, were needed as we were elaborating furnishings required for Christian worship. Following the closure of the cemetery in 1936, the oratory fell into disuse. Its responsibility fell into the hands of the Cathedral Building Committee until 1980, when it was handed over to Merseyside County Council. This tunnel was virtually used by every visitor. It is about 8 feet wide and 12 feet high and follows a downward slope from just to the left of the main cathedral entrance. It has been called an natural arch by some ordnance survey maps. This may be or may be not true. Certainly the chisel marks are evidence on the walls and roof. Point to the fact that the tunnel has been worked. Maybe the tunnel is, a nat is natural but the need was felt to widen this in years gone by. It is likely the tunnel extended further than today. There is some evidence that the stone being removed from the area in 1832. It was written, lightened by one opening to the surface of the ground, rendering the subterranean passage sufficiently frightful to inspire the legendary stories which many of rich fireside tale of fairies, spirits and hobgoblins, which according to the chronicles of the times gone by, performed their vigil night rituals on this spot, to the great terror of every schoolboy and nursery maid, who have ever had the nerve to venture through the darksome way. Today, tombstones line the side of the tunnel, Please pay close attention to the walls and the names of the long lost dead stonemasons have carved their names in the tunnel walls.
St. James's Mount, the site was used by pre-Christian cult, which was known as the Wiccans, and as a dark association with a legendary Lancashire witch named Jenna Green, it was also cast out from the cavern for some obstruct reason. Maybe it was misuse of air powers, although in of a Liverpool mercy rhyme, on the mount stands a lady. Who she is, I do not know. All she wants is gold and silver, and all she wants is a very nice boy. Look closely upon the sandstone face of the mount, and you will detect sinister etchings of the devil's forks, strange hieroglyphics, swastikas, and the three-legged trident, which now symbolise the Isle of Man. The symbol was the coat of arms of a greatly featured Max, Manx magician, Manaman Machler, who had the cloak of invisibility and the power to levitate and fly, also a lethal gift to killing at a distance. His gigantic tomb can still be seen in Peel Castle. During the excavations of St James's Mount in the late Edwardian period, workmen unearthed a curious looking old statue of a long haired woman with outstretched arms wearing an ankle length gown and what looked like a crown of laurel leaves around their head. Around the circle of the plinth of the statue stood were inscriptions and runic hieroglyphics. Further digging around the statue revealed an ancient dwelling, all arranged in a circle, as if some ancient community had revived the female figure. A drinking well was also found on the site, subsequently filled in. The statue, which would have been archaeology value, was taken away by one of the diggers and put in his garden in Wilton. This statue was last seen in the 1950s and is now lost. Could it have been an idol of Jenna Green, known as the, in late generations of the Lancaster children as Jenna Green teeth? Ginny was said to be an old witch who prowled the banks and streams and rivers. For thousands of years, the belief has persisted that the certain people and objects bring misfortune. The story tells of a spectacular emerald like gemstone, which folklore have nicknamed the Green Eye of the Mersey, which brought death, destruction to all those who were unfortunately enough to own it. On the right are the graves to the children of the orphan asylums, both boys and girls, with row after row of long forgotten and little more names. Perhaps for many it was a release from the almost desperate life of poverty and drudgery, but it is impossible to read the inscriptions without feeling deeply moved.
This is the spring in St. James's. If you ask most people where the Liverpool's only one in the spring was, they would struggle to give you an answer. And yet it's in the eastern wall of St. James's it flows. The spring was first discovered in 1773, while work was on the quarry was in progress. A local surgeon, James Worthington, wrote a paper to a medical, medical virtues of this water, especially for loss of appetite, nervous disorders, lowness of spirit, headaches, rickets and weak eyes. Recently, a doctor from nearby Rodney Street used to, used to visit the spring for a drink every day. The spring was surrounded by an iron railings and a ladle attached so people could easily fill bottles and jars from the spa. An interesting point about the spring was made by John Thompson in 1894. Apparently, when they were widening Church Street, they had moved some bodies from St. Peter's Church Cemetery. Among with them was a corpse of Captain James Gerwin, who died on the 21st of July, 1813, aged 76. His body was completely petrified and hardened like stone. It was believed that St. James's Spring may have run in the direction and the mineral water caused a remarkable result. A small plaque above the spring bears an inscription. Christian reader, you and me, an emblem of true charity, who freely what I have bestowed through neither aid nor signal to flow, and I have fully returned from heaven for every cup, cup of water given. This is the story of Tarnia's Wood. The most interesting encounter in the wood was in 1932, June, when Susan Carmichael, aged 13, her younger brother David, aged 11, and their little sister, six-year-old Lucy, met an elf-like entity who called himself Tarnie. The little man measured about three feet from the tip of his pointed green hat to his tiny boots and was dressed in a brown one-piece suit. His face looked quite old and wheezed, and his eyes was particularly had a gold tint, yet he spoke in a Lancashire accent. Tawny came on the scene as Lucy, the youngest child, fell over climbing up the slope into the wood. He helped the child up and she smiled at him, but the two older children were naturally very apprehensive about this strangely dressed mature person who somehow knew their full names and many other details about their lives. 
the children all from Bamba Bridge were staying at their aunt's house in Oak Street for several weeks and each, each day in, in the summer they would hurry down to the cemetery to play with their newfound friend. Little folk who live under the mountain, the caverns and tunnels in, in the cemetery is the very strange tale, surely that's all it is, is a tale. Well the story Tarny was backed up from an unusual credible source. A policeman who walked the Oak Street beat in the 1920s had been seen to told fucking bastard. This is the story about Tarney's Wood. The most interesting encounter was in June 1932 when Susan Carmichael, aged 13, her younger brother, aged 11, and their little sister, six-year-old Lucy, met an elf-like entity who called himself Tarney. The little man measured about three feet from the tip of his pointed green hat to his tiny boots and was dressed in an all-brown one-piece suit. His face looked quite old and wheezed. His eyes was particularly had a golden tint, yet he spoke in a clear Lancashire accent. Tawny came on the scene as Lucy, the youngest child, fell over while climbing up the slope in the wood. He helped the child up and she smiled at him, but the other older children were naturally very apprehensive about the strangely dressed mature person, who somehow knew their full names and many other details about their lives. The children, all from Bamba Bridge, were staying at their aunt's house in Oak Street for several weeks, and each day in the summer they were hurried down to the cemetery to play with their newfound friends. The little folk who live under the mountain caverns and the tunnels, people say, it is a very strange tale, but surely that's all it is, a tale. Well, the story Tarny was backed up from an unusual credible source, a policeman who walked Oak Street Beat in the 1920s had been ridiculed when he told his wife that he had seen fairies playing about St. James's Cemetery after dark. Then, none other than Frederick William Dwelly, the first dean of Liverpool, also expressed interest in Tarney's encounters and said he had heard many tales of little people being seen down St. James's Cemetery over the years and had no reason to doubt the witnesses. Hieroglyphics? Yeah. Like what's around on the wall around there? Where that water comes through the wall there. Eh? 